now we're recording. Thank you, Anna. <laughs> Thanks, Maggie. So hi, everyone. Thanks for joining um, and for letting me present today. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about a project that I'm doing, uh, digitizing, quote unquote, the artist's book collection at Franklin and Marshall College. Um, before I begin, I'd like to just begin with a brief uh, land acknowledgement. The Lenape, Conestoga, and Susquehannock peoples all thrived on the land on which FNM is currently situated for thousands of years before the arrival of colonizers. There is a strong indigenous presence on this land, and FNM is actively working on ensuring that we go beyond a land acknowledgement statement to inclusive action. So, a little bit of background on the collection itself. Um, we currently have a collection of about 205 items, all housed in our archives and special collections. Uh, the collection was begun in 2006 by my predecessor, Louise Culp. Um, and we currently collect artists' books that fall primarily into four categories. So books that lend themselves to formal analysis as 3D artworks and that demonstrate construction on conventions, books that demonstrate studio processes like printmaking, papermaking, um, and photography, books made in the spirit of democratic multiples, especially with curricularly relevant content, and books that reference our institutional identity, including work by the FNM community. So the project impetus. Um, the artist book collection at FNM is primarily a teaching one, um, but the trans with the transition between my predecessor Louise and myself, teaching has diminished is some of those relationships have you know gone away or people have retired that kind of thing um, so since i arrived at fnm i wanted to undertake a digitization or quote unquote digitization project for the collection because artists books are so visual and a catalog search which is just textual can often be more frustrating than helpful because of the lack of images when my colleague brianna gormley our digital initiatives librarian approached me asking if I had any ideas for digital content to share on our repository, this project immediately sprung to mind. Uh, it should be manageable, and I say that now, but I haven't really started too much yet, um, because we have a relatively small collection, and I will be undertaking both the photography and the metadata management myself. Of course, uh, it's not really possible to actually digitize an artist's book, hence the quotes, uh, because they're not typically like traditional print books. In our case, I had the good fortune to be able to shadow a digital photography class this spring semester, um, learning how to successfully operate a DSLR camera and you know the basics of photography. Uh, we currently do have an DSLR in the archives that I will be using to take multiple photographs of each of our artists' books. I'll be utilizing a uniform backdrop to situate my photos and we'll shoot in camera raw so that we're capturing the most information possible before editing the photos to TIFFs or JPEGs, depending on our storage space, um, using Photoshop to display in our digital repository. The photos you're seeing on these slides um, were made by our in-house photographer. She's in-house for FNM, not for the college library, um, Deb Grove and her student assistant, Rilu Gorilla, class of 23, for an exhibition that we put on in conjunction with our campus art museum of a sampling of our artist book collection. Though these images are wonderful, we do not have images of all of our collection from this process, nor do we have the original photos, so I'll be reshooting these items as well. Um, I am planning to begin the photo photographing process as soon as I return to campus and have metadata in hand, which will hopefully be by early July, but we'll see. Um, so speaking of metadata, my colleague Brianna and I met to discuss that and determined that we should be able to export the necessary metadata from our records in OCLC WorldShare, uh, which is a process I'm receiving help with from two additional colleagues, Denise Shmielewski and Bonnie Powers. We are utilizing subject headings, so subject heading artists books and subject heading artist books Rib Jenner to pull relevant metadata for the collection, which I will then sort through and remove any duplicates or false positives like items that have one of the two subject headings but are just books about artists' books rather than examples themselves. I'll be sorting all of this smart record metadata into a spreadsheet based off of a template that Brianna has created, mapping it to Dublin Core in the process to match our platform's needs. Uh, we currently use Islandora 8. 
then Brianna will help me ensure that everything's in place and ready for upload into the system. Um, we haven't yet decided if we'll do batch uploading and releasing uh, as things are done, or if we'll wait until everything is ready at once to publicize the collection. Uh, we do have a series planned with our social media team for Instagram stories uh, for the artist book collection. However, once I have some photos taken. And to wrap up, oh, sorry, I forgot to change that slide. This is another one of our artists books. Um, some further resources for y'all, some more information on our collection of artist books at FNM, including an article that my predecessor wrote about teaching with the artist book collection, um, and links to some digitized collections that I found particularly inspirational as I researched and planned this project. And thank you so much uh, for your time today and for listening. If you'd like to get in touch with me, you know, their document is there and my uh, email and Twitter are on this and I will add them into the document as well. And I'll stop sharing and go back on. Um, okay. Uh, so now we have uh, Malia Van Hupela who oversees the, I'm going to not say this right, Malia, uh, Jean Charlotte, Charlot uh, collection, a large collection of artist papers. Uh, plus the archive of Hawaii artists and architects at the University of Hawaii's Hamilton Library. Um, previously, she worked in the library's preservation department and has served as the collections manager for the state's Art in Public Places collection and for the Iolani Palace. Um, and Malia also uses she, her pronouns, and I'm going to turn it over to Malia. Hey, thank you, Maggie. I'll go ahead and start sharing my screen right away. Hopefully you can see that. We can. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so I am really excited to be able to share with you today the print study collection of Jose Guadalupe Posada prints that are within the Jean Charlot collection here at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Now, I think I have my screen set up wrong. Okay. So this is the Jean Charlotte collection reading room and <clears throat> the Jose Guadalupe Posada prints are a Charlotte's print study collection that is within the Charlotte collection. So Jean Charlotte was a French artist born in 1898 and moved to Mexico in 1921 and became a big part of the Mexican mural movement. And this collection houses his rare books, his master set of prints and his archival collection, as well as print study collections that he acquired. So today I'm gonna to talk about the collection of over 600 prints that he acquired by Jose Guadalupe Posada. And we have just scanned and put these all on Omeka in April. And this is a really popular print collection that we have. Uh, we get inquiries from Mexico and Texas and all, all over the world. Uh, Charlot discovered Posada when he moved to Mexico City. Posada had died in 1913, so he was gone a few years before Charlot arrived. But Charlot would walk by the print shop that still had a lot of the little booklets and broadsides, and he began collecting them, and he started writing about them, and he wrote about them throughout his career. Uh, so this is uh, just the Omeka page, a screenshot of that. And here is, you can see that this is filtered down to the collection and then one of the categories within the different sets of print. So there are 110 of these little chapbooks. These were printed in Spain. All the other prints were printed in Mexico City. Uh, these are on the Spanish history in Mexico. So these were ju juvenile literature pieces and the entire booklets have been scanned and can be downloaded as PDFs. So Char uh, Posada is probably best known for 
is calavera prints. Uh, you see them all over popular culture and especially around the time of uh, the Day of the Dead celebrations and uh, more recently uh, in Disney's Coco, these imageries uh, just became very ubiquitous. So Posada was an incredible illustrator. He was able to convey a story within the, his prints that uh, were for the masses. It was for a largely illiterate population. And so not only do we have the images, but there is the uh, text that accompanies these. Here is an example of one of the religious works. So this is what it looks like when you click on one of those prints and you can see that this one is front and back and Posada created things in every, every different category of whatever would sell. These were um, broadsides and pamphlets that were, and the broadsides are considered penny sheets that you could just pick, pick up for very small amount of money and this is what it looks like when you click on more information and it'll pop out with the metadata for each of the prints and if you're on the live screen you would be able to scroll down to the bottom and see the metadata repeated that's just the way that our omeka is set up and this print is in the category of crimes and sensational events and and this was the most popular of his areas uh, this one is a woman who was torturing a child with hot coals so this uh was something that people would purchase i guess not unlike our <laughs> some of our media today this is from the series of games so this is just a single sheet and there are about 25 of these in the collection and they're really fabulous. Some of them are in color. We have a series of love letters. These are little booklets. And on the verso, you can see the advertisement for the Venegas Arroyo print shop where Posada did most of his work. This is from the category of illusions and magic. And you can see on the left that uh, this has many pages and we've scanned them all. We have not done anything to correct for skewing or where it has been overbound. So sometimes we're not able to get a really nice square image, but we want it to have the appearance of what it would be if you were actually working with the physical object. This is a uh, children's theater. And here we have on the left verses and on the right is politics. Both are fairly large categories within the print collection. And then disasters um, on the left. This is a flood scene and Posada's family, several of them perished in a massive flood in Mexico. And on the right is one of the newspapers that Posada contributed illustrations to. So we have examples in all of these categories and now there are all over 600 of them available online on our Omeka site. And I will share a link to that in the chat. And that's all I have. Thanks for your interest. Thanks Feel free so to reach out. These. Yeah, thank you. Um, these will especially uh, be fabulous in, in my own uh, work for um, comparing to the many uh, broadsides we have from London and some of the archival collections uh, yeah. that we have purchased. Um, and uh, It'll, it'll be interesting for print culture students to see. Um, so thank you so much for making these available to everyone and for Great. giving us a, a tour of them. Thank you. Um, so next uh, we have Megan Carlton. Um, 
Megan is the science librarian and an assistant professor uh, at UNC Greensboro, where she assists students and faculty with research in STEM fields. Um, Megan's current research interests include implementing citizen science projects in undergraduate education and explorations of discipline specific data literacy needs. Megan also uses she, her pronouns. Uh, and Megan, take it away. Okay, so thank you again for having me. Um, we're going to take a very like hard left turn into um, something different, I guess. Um, so I want to talk about the platform a naturalist um, and citizen science images. Uh, since it's not really widely known yet, I first kind of want to explain the concept of citizen science. If my controls didn't get covered up. Here we go. Okay, so in general, citizen science is just public participation in scientific research, um, but it can really be so much more than that. Um, it's an invitation to everyone to participate in real science on topics that they care about. Um, so you can't let it throw you off with that word science in there because it's not just STEM fields. This participation can take many different forms. So I tend to talk about uh, biodiversity projects a lot because that's where my interests lie and um, a lot of faculty that I work with are in biology. Um, so that's what I'm involved with a lot. But the projects can range from, say, language, history, medicine, physics, and really everything in between. Um, this is just a snapshot of some current projects on a citizen science platform called Zooniverse. So regardless of the discipline, the one thing that citizen science projects all have in common is that anyone can participate. Um, there are protocols for each project related to data collection. Um, the data is contributing to a research project of some sort, and that the data that is collected and used is open. So why would we want to use this data and why do we want to collect it like this? So crowdsourcing biodiversity data um, can really be best described in a scenario, I guess. So let's say that you have Steve the scientist over here on the East Coast in the US and he is studying tiger swallowtail butterflies, that little picture on the top right. Um, so like many faculty, over the summer, he might pick a region uh, to travel to to continue and contribute to his research. Um, over the years, he might get funding to travel more places and hire research assistants to kind of help him study in more places. Um, but Steve is still limited by his ability uh, to get a in his ability to get a full picture of where those butterflies are, what they're doing, maybe how their colors changing, things like that. So instead of trying to collect all of the data himself, Steve can now use a crowdsourced biodiversity uh, data collected by millions of citizens worldwide. So using the app iNaturalist or platform that I'm going to show you, this is what the um, data on the Eastern tiger swallowtail looks like um, just in the last 10 years. So there's been over 41,000 um, observations, and each of these observations includes a date and time, location, and more often than not, a photograph um, of, the, of the species that you're observing. So it becomes really obvious how valuable this information is to scientists, but why do people like me or um, anybody in the neighborhood, why do kids want to contribute to the site? So iNaturalist, again, it's a crowdsourced uh, species identification system and an organism occurrence recording tool. So you can use it to record your own observations and get help with those identifications, you know, figuring out what that animal is or what that plant is um, by collaborating with others on the platform. So this kind of information can be used for just a common purpose or to access all of the observational data that's uh, collected by other iNaturalist users. 
So despite the fact that a naturalist can be a bit technical and seem scientific, their primary goal is really to connect people to nature. And by that, they mean getting people to feel that the non-human world um, has personal significance and is really worth protecting. So what does this have to do with image resources? Um, the best that I could really come up with, and I'm sure y'all can see way more connections than I can, but even in biodiversity research, a picture is worth a thousand words. So um, with that, I am gonna show you, jump out and show you what this site actually looks like. If I can move my controls once again. So this is the homepage of iNaturalist. Um, to date, you can see right here, it is really worldwide and there are over 69 million observations on iNaturalist. So each one of these observations, um, we can look at it a little easier. Um, each one of these 69 million observations requires some sort of proof or evidence that that um, creature existed there. And most people do that through a photograph because that's the easiest way to say, look, this bee, it was here. Here's a picture of it. Um, so let's see. So you can search uh, through these uh, through all of these 69 million observations. They're either your species, your taxonomic group, or like location, but they will also give you, oh my gosh, sorry, all of these controls are in the way. Um, but they can also give you, you know, if you're just interested in looking at birds and wanna look at pictures, you can do that. But let's say you want to look at something more specific, you can go through and say, okay, I wanna see, pictures of grizzly bears. Um, and you can go through and look at each of these observations, but the really great thing is that you can see, and scientists can see, oh wow, exactly where all of those observations took place. So they can see where that animal um, has been seen, if it's somewhere outside its normal range, or, and they can also look at this data over time. So they can see if their range is shifting, which of course is very um, helpful. So you can also, I just keep moving these controls right where I'm trying to go. I'm sorry. Um, so it will also keep track of all of your observations on your profile. Um, so I can look at the ones that me and my daughter take. Um, the map isn't very helpful, but our little grid, we like to keep track of all the photos um, that we take. And I kind of have like a species checklist in my head of, you know, birds that I still want to see and everything, but it, it really goes beyond that. So again, with these photographs, each of these observations, again, they have the time the picture was taken, where that is. And then other people, that first time that you um, put up a picture, it will, um, the site will suggest what they think that animal is, and you can agree with it, or pick something else what you think it is, but then other people um, need to agree with you on what that species is before it becomes kind of research grade. Um, so there's other um, data included that you can or you don't have to put this, whether the animal's alive or dead, the life stage, um, the sex of the animal, things like that. So this will also show you what projects that this picture, this observation has been included in. Um, some of these will be added automatically if they fit certain criteria, which I'll show you one of those. But for this one, I, am involved in some community projects uh, just that are for fun um, with my children that I choose to join and then it will pull my observations and contribute it, them to this community initiative. Um, so a really interesting one, and another way that scientists kind of use this, um, like one of the projects that's more recent is the Squirrel Mapper, Mapper project. So anytime anybody adds a Eastern gray squirrel observation to their page, this project will automatically pull that. Um, and what they're looking at is how their coat color has started to evolve. Um, most Eastern gray squirrels used to be black and now they are slowly changing colors. So they're, um, they very quickly got 96,000 observations when they started this like in January of this year. Um, so 
they are able to really gather a lot of data for their um, for their research. But I will leave you with slides, just some general links. And I know this, like I usually do an hour long, what is citizen science? So this was a, a very small dose and there's many, many applications for this. And I would love to talk to people about it and get any, um, answer any questions that you have. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, I invited Megan to come speak to us because I think this is super cool. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe not uh, something that everyone is aware of. Uh, I'm aware of it because Megan is such a nerd about it. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, Megan has gotten lots of people in our department into, uh, into contributing to iNaturalist. Um, okay, so uh, now um, we have a talk by Regan Murphy Gao. Um, who is the Japanese Studies Librarian and Head of Special Collections at the East Asia Library at Stanford. Um, and also Tashi Mara, who is the Japanese, uh, or Librarian for Japanese Collection at the CV Star East Asian Library at UC Berkeley. Um, and uh, both Regan and Tashi use she, her pronouns. And I will mute myself. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, hi. Um, so uh, today, um, Ligan and I are pleased to present a new video series initiated by the North American Coordinating Council on Japanese Library Resources, NCC, CDDP Task Force, which offers instructional videos on freely available image and textual resources and cutting edge projects related to Japanese studies. Um, you may not know what NCC does. Um, NCC is a nonprofit organization with the council members consisting of librarians and researchers in Japanese studies, which was established 30 years ago to improve access to library resources and other information about Japan through grant programs and by working with collaborating organizations in North America, Japan, and elsewhere. NCC's oldest and most well-established well grant program was Multi-Volume Sets Project, which uh, with the primary funding provided by the Japan-US Friendship Commission, which helped to build a national print collection of Japanese research materials in the US. With this federal funding suspended in 2018, NCC formed the Comprehensive Digitization and Discoverability Program, CDDP Task Force, aiming to develop a new grant program by bringing to light hidden collections, enabling more robust use of special collections, fostering training in digitization projects, and promoting collaboration nationally and internationally. In 2020, under the COVID-19 pandemic, CDDP Task Force changed the project plan and decided to use the Toshiba International Foundation grant to initiate this video series. Thank you, Toshiba. Um, so from the beginning, the, national, uh, the NCC was formed to ensure that access to Japanese materials extended beyond major research libraries. And the adoption of IIIF in Japan the um, International Image Interoperability Framework uh, coincided with our rethinking of how to achieve this aim. In 2018, when the NCC formed the CDDP Task Force, digitized images were basically unavailable from Japan. There had been a resistance to digitizing, which was only overcome with the adoption of IIIF. Um, in fact, in October of 2017, when I joined our digital library group and went to Japan to introduce IIIF, um, only Kyoto University had adopted it. And at the time, National Diary was considering it. And as you um, sure know, the benefits of IIIF are many, including mitigating the problem of frequent changes in technologies for viewing images by creating an international standard enabling the reuse of APIs rather than having to rebuild from scratch um, with each digital project, uh, delivering images in a secure manner, 
Finally, um, you know, comparison, deep zoom, annotation are all available. By 2020, there was widespread adoption of IIIF in Japan, providing a new level of access to digitized Japanese materials. Japan Search, uh, the first resource highlighted in our CDDB video series, is a portal that provides access to digitized materials from uh, libraries, research centers, and museums from across Japan. It's continuing to grow, but currently has uh, 124 databases and offers access to 3.3 million items. And among the many uh, really great features are the ability to use image search. And so if you find an item you, you're interested in, you can search for similar looking items, or you can even upload an image um, and search for th similar things. And the National Diet Library is producing um, Japan search. So another great resource is Cultural Japan. This is um, a portal that provides access to digitized images of Japanese materials from across the globe. Um, it's actually produced by a small number of volunteers uh, who are experts in um, digital projects. And it actually includes materials from 41 different countries and 82 databases and over 2,000 organizations. Um, both Japan Search and Cultural Japan provide the opportunity to engage with uh, digitized materials in innovative ways. Japan Search allows the user to select items, annotate, group them together, crop them, and then export them to your own website. Um, and they call this feature MyNote. Uh, and then Cultural Japan has this really neat um, something called self museum where you can curate your own exhibit and then there's a virtual experience of walking through a museum and seeing the items. Um, so it's a lot of fun and you use any AAAF materials so it doesn't have to be um, materials you find on, on cultural Japan. So the first four uh, videos in our series focused on access um, and then places, you know, places where do you find the huge numbers of suddenly available Japanese images and then how do you engage with those materials on those sites? We also wanted to include um, introductions to tools that make it easy to give some context to, to digitized collections. And so we have here um, three videos, one on Omeka, one on Spotlight, and one on Scalar. And Professor Young of University of Calgary, uh, Kathy Astor at Stanford, and... Uh, Professor Sheriff at Oberlin created these wonderful videos that introduce the projects they created, but also why they chose the tools that they chose. And so with the newly available digitized um, materials, Professor Young at University of Calgary, he just jumped at the opportunity and he said, you know, I, the biggest obstacle that I see are people's inability to read the, the handwritten text. And so I want to help. Um, and so he has these two neat, really cool projects. One is called Listen to a Graphic Novel, in which he speaks the, what's written there, and he, there's a little red line next to what he's reading, um, because these things are very, very hard to read. And the other one is called 100 Classical um, Kind of Words in Motion, where he used this analog method of a digital pen to provide a GIF so that you can get a sense of how these things are written. Um, and in the final project, he'll have the reading, he'll have the characters used, and then he'll have this GIF, and he has the translation. So they're just really neat and sort of innovative ways of using, taking advantage of the digital medium. Um, another one that I thought was really fun is that they're using um, these two different projects, Mina de Hongoku and Kronet Recognition Service, are uh, they're taking advantage of the digitized images in order to um, overcome this problem with reading cursive writing. Um, as um, Professor Klauner points out in her article, or in her video, um, 0.01% of Japanese can read this cursive writing. Um, and so it's a huge barrier for anything written before 1900. Um, and so what she's done is uh, she's treated these script as, a, as an image, and then she's performing, providing, a, she's created an AI where it compares it to uh, well-known or uh, known images, known characters. And so she's created this AI that can read it for you or can kind of guess at what these things are. Um, and she's able, so she's able to sort of treat text as an image and make it, you know, suddenly readable. 
Um, so it's a, it's a huge, huge breakthrough. Um, and then this other one, Minanda Kohonkuku, is just, this wonderful crowdsourcing platform where you can go in and it, you should sort of join a community of friends who are trying to transcribe these texts and they all interact with each other. It's, oh, you did a good job. Oh, what about this? Um, and so it's, it's become a community and a really fun thing to do. And they also have included this AI. So if you're really stuck and you don't know what the character is, you can use the AI from um, the Kudonet, it's a CG recognition service. Um, so those are just really fun and sort of innovative ways of, of using digitized um, materials. Um, so the current status is we have 12 videos in the series and it's still growing. We group them in different categories. So we group them as discover, build, participate, collaborate, study, and a lot of them overlap. Um, and we're thinking we want this to continue growing. And so our next steps is we're hoping to create an award program and sort of solicit videos from, from others. And um, so they can create short, you know, these are all 10 to 20 minute videos where they tell us about their project, tell us about the tools they use. Um, so that should be coming together uh, by the end of the year. And then the last thing I just wanted to, to acknowledge all the people involved um, in this project. It was a lot of work and a lot of people <laughs> um, you know, contributed to it. So all the task force members and then the contributors. Um, so I wanna just thank them and acknowledge their hard work. And that's it. And there's the, the link if, you are, if you're curious to check out the videos. They're very short and really fun. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so much. This is so super cool. And I love the uh, the use of AI for character recognition and suggestion. Um, uh, this is really interesting and I look forward to checking it out. Um, okay, so we have one final lightning talk um, from Bonnie Finn, uh, who is the fine arts librarian at the College of St. Benedict. St. John's University in St. Joseph and Collegeville, Minnesota. Uh, Bonnie holds a master's of music in musicology and a master of science in information science from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Bonnie is the liaison librarian for music, theater, art, and teaches information literacy for those subjects, as well as to first year students. Bonnie also uses she, her pronouns. Uh, and I will turn it over to Bonnie. Thank you. Thanks for having me and letting me do this. Can you all see my screen? Is it? Yes. Okay, perfect. Perfect. So I'm going to talk about how to teach students to ethically find and use online images. With COVID, it became kind of a necessity to do that. So there was a process. Um, when COVID first happened that first summer, um, all these uh, modules came about through a summer 2020 NEH CARES grant. Um, we created Canvas modules for humanities classes and I did the Hispanic studies class. And so these modules are available on Canvas Commons if anyone wants to go find them and use them. And for the Hispanic studies class, I created a visual literacy, a finding and using images and then citing an image just because that's important, of course, for ethic, um, teaching students about the ethics. And then it kind of evolved into a couple more art classes that I'll talk about. So the first section, the visual literacy module, I used Dana's uh, dig method to teach them how to evaluate the images. And they were especially related to authority and bias. It was a, a transatlantic migration class that talked about Latin America. Um, uh, these are the assignments. I just have screenshots of some of the assignments that we used to give you an idea of what we went through to um, present the information. Um, the next module was finding and using images because, of course, they're going to have to go figure out how to find them. And this was the project that um, they had to do. It was two part. The next part was citation. It began with an overview of copyright, which, of course, most students don't even think about when it comes to online stuff. Um, fair use, they assume because they're in college, that means they can use it. And so we talked about the differences of that and in um, a little bit about creative commons. And I did a demonstration of reverse image searching. Most students, there were a pretty fair amount that didn't know about images.google.com and that you could drag a, a, an image into that website and it will find it for you. There's also um, the tineye.com. It doesn't have quite as much as Google does, of course, but with Google, you do have to be careful of, of what it pulls up because of the licensing and copyright isn't always good. The other thing that I focused on was how to utilize art store features. I think most um, institutions do have subscriptions to art store. And so I wanted to show them how to create an account and save and download images and get that metadata off there and how to create image groups. So these are some of the instructions off the slides that I had for the class. 
the last um, module for the NEH CARES grant was um, citing images. It, so many students, you know, they, they, they copy whatever they find for the citation style. So we took a different approach for this and decided that instead we were going to talk about bibliographic elements rather than specific citation modules. Um, and we talked about the anatomy of a citation um, and what it was together so that we could show them what they need to look for, whether they're looking for a book or an article or whatever. And then we taught them how to find that additional information for images that they need to find sometimes the dimensions and the medium and the type. And um, I took them to the Creative Commons site and showed them how to find the images website and kind of stressed how important it was to get to that, that original image and not just use something you find from Flickr, which I'll show you in a minute can be really dangerous for copyright. Um, I showed them where the bibliographic elements were on Art Store, as well as on the online images. In this case, this is Europeana website. And I showed them how you can click on it and go to the actual museum, or you can find the all um, detail, all metadata, explain to them what the metadata was and what they were looking for, so that they could find all the information to, to appropriately cite the items and the images they were getting. Um, once we finished with the Hispanic Studies in the H class, I went into a couple of art classes, the first being intro to graphic design and intro to computer art. And they were looking at more transformation of things. And as we were going through the classes, you could kind of tell the students didn't understand what public domain was. They thought because images were on the public, you know, on the web, that meant, oh, they're in public domain then. So we did talk a little bit deeper about copyright. We talked about the types of image websites, which I'll show you in a minute here. Um, and then uh, we, we talked about how to find terms of service on a website. Where do you go for these things? But these are the subjects that we covered for the permissions, public domain, copyright, and creative commons. Um, we really focused a lot on searching for images online as well. And um, there are active links in my PowerPoint if anyone wants that after. One of the things that we noticed is when you go to creativecommons.org, they are now part of Flickr. So when you look, I'm just searching for a cat, on the side, you can see all the different sources. And so I showed them how to eliminate the, the different websites that you don't want to use for images you might be transforming at some point. Um, I really encourage them to go find museums or digital collections at other institutions because that's a little bit clearer on how you can use the image. And I, on my research guide, I made sure that they were pointed in that direction and, and kind of showed how to find those scholarly sources. Like these ones that are already presented today are gonna to be awesome. They're going on my research guide. Um, one of the other things about online images as we were going through these classes is we realized that, that images, are kind of divided into different groups. And you know, you have a photo sharing community like Flickr. You usually have to sign up for it, create a free account or whatever. But um, places like Flickr and Pinterest and Instagram, the people uploading those images usually don't understand what they're being asked for with the copyright. And you need to read the terms of service and see what is allowed to do with those images. Um, one of the other places is stock photos, you know, where the professional people go in and they submit all their images and it can be licensed for creative use. It usually costs money and that's not something the students are looking for at the time. And again, the artist communities, a lot of times people are selling their, their work and it's not a place where you can really just grab images and go. So again, I, I really push the museums, digital collections, have public domain works, you know, MoMA art store, and those places where you can get the um, information that you are looking for. We talked about Google searching. Um, about a week after I had done this, Google went and changed their page. So now they're there when you search and use these image rights, it now drops to Creative Commons licenses and commercial and other licenses. So it's a lot harder to find the, um, oh, that's nice with Megan, all the images on our naturalist have their CC license, which is wonderful. So, but it, it's a little bit harder to find something just Googling. So I've, I've tried to come up with an exercise that would work on the, um, how to find these terms. And so this is the activity we did in class and it worked pretty well. Um, 
even online in chat, I had this, I showed the students what the terms of use looked like on Flickr. And if you look at it, you can't alter or modify any of their materials. So that kind of eliminates anything that they can use that, that appears on Flickr. So the activity we came up with is I wanted them to Google an image like cat and clip art. So it would pull up mostly clip art websites and find the terms of service on that website and then share the link in the chat. And then once everybody had done that, we, we pulled up, I pulled up the link and had the student talk about what they found. And the comments, they were really surprised at how limiting some of them could be. And um, they, they started listening to copyright and really paying attention to what they could and couldn't use, which I thought was pretty cool. If the professor asks for it, I go ahead and I add information on Chicago citation or whatever they're, if they're asking for AP or whatever, use Chicago for art history um, and give an example of how to find the metadata and how to plug it all in. But one of the things that kept coming up was for adapted images. How do you cite an adapted image? So I did up a slide on that. According to Chicago, this is how you're supposed to do it. And then I also pointed out the best practices for Creative Commons attributions because it is a little bit different than the traditional Chicago style, but this is what Chicago says to do. Uh, and you want to make sure you have active links to all the Creative Commons attributions. So one of the, what we learned in class, I, they learned to think about where they're finding their image, who posted it, what website is it on, what's it gonna be used for? Um, using the images, is it licensed, whether it's Creative Commons or otherwise, is it in the public domain and how do you really check that? Is it being altered or used as is and, and, and teaching them to use the, the terms of use? And just so many students had no clue that was even on the websites. And I really stressed about how important citing images was to give the proper attribution and to ask permission for it. So that is my little spiel here. So I'll stop sharing my screen. And I feel like I talked really fast, so I will share the PowerPoint slides too. Thank you, thank you so, so much. And thank you to everyone who presented. Um, again, uh, there is a community notes document um, for these talks, um, but I'm sharing the link for that again. Uh, and I will be following up um, with the presenters uh, to get copies of their slides to host on the ARIC website. Um, as well as posting the recording to these lightning talks um, because I forgot to record the rest of the meeting. Um, and so I'm actually uh, going to stop the recording um, uh, right now. Uh, stop recording. <laughs>